In our last uh, lecture, we were looking at Marie Antoinette uh, from the point of view of clothes, which is really quite an unusual way of looking at it. But what I'm really trying to do with this series of power dressing is to show uh, in many ways the way in which these three emblematic women um, created a style which uh, went out of fashion, literally, when the particular regime that maintained them um, had run its course and was ready for change. So uh, if you actually take a very long distant view of what happened to Marie Antoinette, uh, we have her with the extraordinary court dress, of, which talks of prestige, of excess, uh, of the distance of royalty from the rest of society, um, that was no longer a regime which could exist at the end of the 18th century. And Marie Antoinette disappears with that type of clothing, um, exacerbating or hastening her exit because inadvertently she adapts the dress of uh, the philosophy of the Enlightenment. In other words, she tried to, to wear these simple shifts and go back to the simple life, which was advocated by Rousseau and Voltaire, who were some of the main thinkers behind the end of the Ancien Regime, bringing on the modern world. The same sort of thing is in many ways is going to happen for Josephine. She's going to literally embody um, a style which uh, gets away you know, does away with clutter, which is the simplicity of, theoretically, um, the republic, uh, the return to, to um, ideas of, of civism and things like that. Uh, she will be taken up by Napoleon, who will use her for his propaganda, and uh, she will be repudiated mm. by him, divorced, uh, in fact, she's divorced t twice, uh, and in many ways, she goes out of style when that ideal behind the Republic goes out of style. Napoleon takes on the kind of dress, uses her to propagate it throughout Europe, but then clutters it to such an extent that it no, no, you can see in many ways that Napoleon has lost the plot politically as well. Now, this is maybe a simplistic way of looking at, at, at history, but um, everything in a society is um, a sign of something else. And with the third lecture, I want to also emphasize the same approach. Um, I'm going to be talking about the Empress Eugenie uh, and the fact that at the time when the new city, you actually have a totally new society which is being built under the Industrial Revolution, Paris is renewed on a monumental scale where um, visual culture, the, the bigger you are, the more you, you uh, ostentation was the, the, the sign of the day. Um, her skirt that she will develop is the crinoline, which is very much like the kind of buildings and the ideas behind the renovation of Paris. Now, of course, the crinoline goes out of style virtually at the end of the Second Empire when the monumentality, the bombast and the sort of uh, all of the <coughs> ideas of the Carnival Empire are no longer valid. Uh, and you have that huge bloodbath of the French Commune and out of it you come to, a, again, a different style. So to some degree, these three women, in the way they dress, show uh, at the sort of uh, hinge of different, three different regimes. Now, um, I've when, I think when I put on your leaflet the, the title of today's lecture, it was uh, Josephine's Sartorial Survivor. And indeed, that is exactly what she does. She survives by her ability to um, uh, exhibit or represent in her person the um, movements of society. Uh, she starts out as an absolute frump and ends up as a fashion icon uh, because she, uh, going through extremely hard times, has learned that this is the way to survive. And she um, is adapted or, or taken on by Napoleon because of her ability um, to uh, be stylish and to represent um, the ideas that he wishes to put forward with his new empire. So we're going to um, trace this woman who uh, usually is seen uh, as being uh, a wilting violet. I mean, really one of these people, she's always crying, she's always, you know, the victim of Napoleon. In actual fact, um, she is a very tough, resilient survivor uh, who is clever enough to make out she's or appear dumb. 
I mean, this is this is how well she's done it. Didn't, I don't know whether you were brought up in the generation of, you know, um, for heaven's sake, dear, you know, boys don't like clever girls. No, you didn't ever. Yeah. I spent an awful lot of time giggling inanely at Scotch College boys' jokes and things. <laughs> but anyway, it never got me anyway. So, all right, now, um, this is recorded. I better just get on with the job. Now, um, <laughs> I'm, I'm actually now going to look at five, these are the five regimes through which she lives. Uh, and which she survives by adapting uh, through the style of her dress. And uh, dress at this time, at the time of the French Revolution, was a question of life and death. If you got it wrong, you were either guillotined or beaten up. So she really learns in a very hard school. Now, I just wanted to quickly go through these times so that um, you're not totally confused when I'm, I'm talking about the different uh, regimes. Because remember, one of the themes that I'm also talking about in this series is the idea idea of rapid change, which is initiated with the French Revolution. Uh, and indeed, that's what fashion is, isn't it? This constant ability to change. And you'll see this um, with Josephine very much today. Well, the Revolution of 1789, we've, we've already spoken about that, which ends uh, with the fall of Robespierre in 1795. Now, um, at the time, there is this great rejoicing, and this will be a very important time for uh, Josephine to come to the fore. What happens there is a government of five men are put in uh, into power. They are called the directors, the directeurs, and the main one there will be a man called Barras, B-A-R-R-A-S, who will be the, the lover um, of Josephine and will launch her uh, in a career, a sort of semi-courtesan type of career. Um, during this time, uh, you see the rise of Bonaparte, who is still the citizen Bonaparte, uh, rises as general, uh, marries uh, Josephine, and comes back from Egypt to take over from the Directoire um, as one of three consuls, right? So it's interesting that you still have this nomenclature re reflecting the ideas of the Republic, you know, the, which was the Great Republic, the Roman Republic. So therefore, when he comes to power, as they did in ancient Rome, you had three consuls. Of course, Napoleon isn't going to be one of three, is he? He then takes over as main consul. So that is called the consulate. And that also has a style, which is reflected very much in the style of Man Maison. Um, you then get in 1804, I'm not sure, I thought it was 1804, anyhow, 1805, um, Napoleon crowns himself uh, as emperor and uh, becomes the emperor Napoleon, right? He, until then, he was Bonaparte. Uh, and then, of course, uh, at Waterloo uh, arrives, and in 1815, you have the restoration of the Bourbon kings, right? The, remember, Louis XVI was guillotined. His two brothers will actually come to the throne uh, as Bourbon. Uh, and Josephine, at this time, will be living, uh, will have been divorced and is living by herself at Malmaison, still adapting to style, still a sort of magnet, for um, all of the crowned heads of Europe, amongst whom the greatest enemy of Napoleon, um, who comes to visit her and actually gives her a diamond tiara. I mean, this is networking at its very best, I can tell you. <laughs> a very, very canny woman, but managing to look absolutely so, sort of, you know, as if a breath of air would blow her away. All right, now... <laughs> This is the traditional image, isn't it, of, 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 of Napoleon, you know, the ogre. And I must actually put in a little plug for Napoleon here, not that he needs it really, is that he has been given a very bad press by the English. First of all, um, the word bogeyman comes from, you know, the way in which English children were threatened by the bogeyman. This comes from Bonaparte. Also, Bonaparte wasn't all that small. He was about five foot six. Uh, you, you really only needed to be five foot four to be in the, in the French army. Um, what else is there? Is that, that he was he was a horrible, you know, uh, tyrant. Uh, you know, the, the the bloody tyrant of Europe. In fact, he was an extremely uh, intelligent uh, polymath who was interested in e every form of uh, intellectual discourse. But anyhow, here we have the popular image of um, Josephine, you know, the wilting violet. And of course, the other thing that you get, the apocryphal phrase, is not tonight, Josephine, just as you got, you know, let them eat cake. Uh, the difference with the not tonight, Josephine, is of course that it actually was coined, but it was actually um, an ad for British stout, where you have... Um, um, Josephine's offering Napoleon some stout and he says, oh, not tonight, Josephine. So it doesn't translate into French at all. 
All right, so this then is the popular image, um, but who was this woman um, who we're going to investigate? Uh, well, she was born on the island of Martinique, uh, and she was a Creole. Now, this doesn't mean that she has mixed blood. The Creoles meant that they were actually um, a French aristocracy, and this was the noblesse de, uh, de robe. In other words, this is the true noblesse. She didn't come from the uh, nobles who had actually gained their titles through um, war. So she comes from an ancient line, the Tachet de la Pacherie, uh, born up in this, uh, born in on these plantations, living a very, very simple, easy life. So which means she has had very little in the way of education, you know, reading and writing, but that was really all that was necessary for a girl dancing. A very sort of sybaritic lifestyle, manages to ruin her teeth sucking on sugar cane, and this will be um, why you actually get the pictures of her looking a little bit tense, um, but she manages to turn into an absolutely charming, enigmatic smile. And she was also extremely short-sighted, which she managed to also turn into a plus, because she would stare into the man's eyes, you know, she couldn't actually see him, but this was seen as sort of, you know, absolute adoration, and of course Napoleon was very taken by this. Um, he did have his faults. Now, um, so he, there she is on the island, and this is, is an interesting point because she, for the rest of her life, she will attempt to recreate these sort of havens or, or Eden-like havens, and that will be at the origin of her garden at Malmaison, where she will import all sorts of exotic plants and animals to, to remind her of her home. Now, what happens here is that her aunt um, is having an affair with one of the Beauharnais, one of the, the Vicomte de Beauharnais in France, and wants to legitimize her relationship in some way, and so asks one of her nieces, sends the thing I'm saying, send one of your nieces to marry to Alexandre, and do it quickly. Well, they're about to send the eldest, but she unfortunately dies, so uh, Rose is shipped out. And it's very much like Marie Antoinette, the way in which she, this also happened to her. So she was, at, at the age of 14 and a bit, um, comes over to France. Now, uh, she's a dumpy, little, unsophisticated uh, girl, uh, and she is suddenly uh, propelled into the Beauharnais family. Uh, this is Alexandre, a very sophisticated salonier. Uh, in the Parisian circles, women are supposed to be able to hold their own, right? This is the, the salon at the time were the circulation of ideas. Um, women um, held a salon on a certain day and they would, were known for inviting people of certain political uh, inclinations. But this is how ideas spread. You'd invite Voltaire and you'd, you'd invite Delacroix and they would talk. Uh, and so this was an extremely important intellectual thing. Now, women knew how to facilitate conversation. They knew how to make the whole evening go. Rose didn't have a clue. And uh, she's a great embarrassment to uh, Du Beauharnais, who um, has two children by her and returns quickly um, to uh, his womanizing and his sophisticated life in Paris. Now, um, the two children that she will have um, are actually quite important from the point of view of uh, the crowned heads of Europe today. The eldest one is Eugène, uh, and he will be married by Nap Napoleon, will marry him off, as, he, as Napoleon did with all of his relatives. He made strategic marriages um, to the daughter of the King of Bavaria. And it is through his line, through the Beauharnais line, that you now get the crowned heads of Sweden, Denmark, Norway, Finland, Luxembourg. All right? They're all descendants um, of the Beauharnais line. And, it, and when we're actually looking at, at Josephine's jewellery, um, you'll see these um, queens and princesses now wearing her tiaras, uh, which is really actually quite interesting. Um, the other do the daughter, Hortense, uh, married, was married off to Napoleon's brother, Louis. When Napoleon thought that he couldn't have any children, he married his stepdaughter to his brother, are you with me? And he was going to ad adopt his nephew or step-grandson. Uh, this actually, he decided not to do it. it was, he realized he could have children uh, and then got rid of Josephine and married an archduchess instead. So, however, what I'm trying to say is these two children actually had quite a significant role in uh, politics of the time. Uh, and finally, the daughter, at least Hortense, will have one of her sons will become Napoleon III, who will take up the legacy uh, of uh, Napoleon I, and it is his Paris we'll be looking at next week. 
Well, what happened to a woman who had no style, who had no class, all right, who really was so frumpy that you didn't know what to do with her, she was an embarrassment? Well, you sent them off to a convent, all right, get thee to a convent. This wasn't um, to enter an order. Um, at, this is the convent in the Rue, uh, it's in the Saint-Germain, uh, the Pontéon co uh, convent. Uh, and there were a whole wing which was given over to repudiated wives. Um, now, by this stage, she had two children. She was about 18, 19, um, uneducated, as I said, but it, she has the gumption to rise up um, against her problems and takes Alexandre de Beauharnais to court um, to get enough money to survive with her children because Beauharnais was trying to make out that Hortense wasn't his. And she's so plucky that she even manages to get his family on her side and wins the case um, at a time when Paris was extremely unstable. So already there's an indication that she is someone who is going to be um, a networker and a mover and certainly <coughs> not someone who just sort of sits back and allows events to overcome her. You'll see this all the way along. Uh, she was a wheeler and a dealer, in fact, even undermining uh, the efficiency of her husband, Napoleon's army, by taking on with her lover um, the um, supply <coughs> companies that supplied the poor old great army with their shoes and with their victuals and all the rest of it. And she was making a fortune out of it by giving them shoddy material uh, with her lover. Well, poor old Napoleon's out there thinking, now, why is it that we're not winning? All right, so, but this is very much the way in which she operated. Well, while she's there, this is a, a, absolutely a turning point um, in her life. Uh, she's realized that she cannot survive unless she adopts the manner of the French, the, even though she speaks French. She speaks with a very lilting accent. She's clearly a Creole. Um, so there she's amongst a lot of aristocratic French women and she learns, she studies how to curtsy, how, the kind of conversation you make, how to write letters, and all sorts of bedroom, you know, boudoir type secrets she, she takes on board. And she will use these very much because to some degree she's going to survive as, as a courtesan really through that directoire period. So all of the lessons that she'll learn here will stand her in great stead. Now, what to wear to the French Revolution? Now, uh, during this time, Alexandre, uh, although he is an aristocrat, he's a very liberal-minded aristocrat, and espouses the Republican cause. Uh, this is before the terror, before Robespierre, and becomes a general in the French Revolutionary Army. Uh, unfortunately, he spent too much time in the salon and not enough time uh, learning military technique. And his, under his leadership, the uh, armies of the Republic suffer massive defeats. And he's brought back virtually in court martial. Uh, his, his inability to lead was, was, was put down to the fact that he's an aristocrat and he's probably undermining the armies and that he was doing it deliberately. So he'll be taken to the uh, conciergerie and will await. Uh, uh, execution, summary execution. Now this is, is a painting which is sort of imagined of Josephine, almost unrecognizable with the two children saying goodbye to uh, Beauharnais. During this time, uh, Rose, even though she's estranged from her husband, um, is now seen as being tainted by being an aristocrat. And so she has to um, adopt a revolutionary clothing. All right. So um, this is then a time when your political allegiances were very much something that were displayed through your clothes. Uh, the way you spoke also. I mean, people no longer used the rule form, which was the polite form in French. You had to, everyone had to address each other as tu, which is, is much more familiar. There was this concept of egalitarianism. Uh, and so here we have, uh, this is the sans culotte. The culotte, of course, is the short pants, which was elongated by the, uh, the French revolutionaries and which is the forerunner of trousers that we have now. Now, originally the word pant, 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 pantalon were pants um, was a derogatory form because it was uh, the person who was the first person who had pants was pantaloon, you know, the one in the Commedia dell'arte. So it was seen as a comic form of dress. Uh, but this is um, adopted by the sans-culotte without these people who refuse to wear 
the, um, the appanage of the Ancien Regime. So that's the name refers to their clothes. Do you see how important it is? Um, the, the Phrygian bonnet, which was the sign of the freed slave. Now, this is um, one of the reasons here you can see why this is a doomed regime. Um, you actually have this mixture of Ancien Regime type clothes. This is the king who is attempting to um, come to terms with the uh, turmoil in society and show himself as a king as also being part of this revolutionary movement hoping that it will end up in a constitutional monarchy but the vestimentary signs are ridiculously contrasting you have him with the ancien regime with the the silk jabot and the silk waistcoat the song the culotte and then he's got um, the Phrygian bonnet and crying out vive la nation so the, the ambiguity of his dress shows in the ambiguity of his position and clearly this could not continue it has to go one way or another and of course he will have to be removed now women in particular at this time um, took on um, the colors I think we've, we've mentioned this before didn't we about the the colors of the revolution red and blue the colors of Paris white um, the color of the monarchy when, when was, people were hoping for um, uh, some kind of compromise between the two so here we have um, a, a French woman um, the, the chains of, of, of tyranny have been broken and she's on you know the cannons that are going to destroy tyranny and so on now um, it's interesting that the Republic uh, needs an emblem and it's still today the, the figure of Marianne is in all the mairie across uh, France it's still the Republic is still this woman uh, and here you have uh, th this is the sort of embodiment of the Republic now she's she looks a bit sort of you know jolly hockey sticks here but she she really actually is um, like an, an ancient Greek goddess or Roman goddess with the Phrygian bonnet uh, de depicting freedom um, here this sort of triangle r refers to the um, uh, importance of, of, of learning in the age of, of, of uh, the Enlightenment and this is the um, ivy of, of faithfulness to, to the cause uh, and here here again is the embodiment of the Republic which is becoming and what's quite interesting with the Republican imagery um, it takes on sort of Catholic iconology uh, iconography um, this could very much be um, one of the uh, sort of martyred saints in a in a Renaissance painting uh, the way she's sort of you know leaning on something she's holding the palm you know which was the sign of martyrdom um, here it's sort of the sign of freedom the Phrygian bonnet and so on and very much the uh, uh, dress now um, the government also took on massive uh, public displays which were, were going to take the place of the feast days and take the place of the Catholic ceremonies which which people evidently couldn't do without so here you have Marianne or, or this who is represents the supreme being uh, which is this idealized idea of, of France and freedom who is coming along here brought along by oxen you know which represent freedom and oxen were used in the uh, ancient Rome for the processions and here you have people in their red white and blue going up to sacrifice um, to the supreme being up here uh, now this uh, also at this time then you you see that women's clothes um, adopt or, or, or speak of the ideals of the revolution and the revolution what is it it was democracy what are the great seats of democracy ancient Greece and ancient Rome so the first type of uh, dress that you will get during the revolution is more a reference to ancient Greece uh, but um, with the cockade or this is actually a red and blue one on their hats and you, you're beginning to get fashion magazines that are going to appear telling people how to dress for the revolution now if you got it wrong you could be um, beaten up in the streets uh, if you had the wrong color of the cockade for example the aristocracy still tried to wear black they'd be beaten up people sometimes had to be saved from being lynched if they were wearing the wrong colors if they used the wrong kind of language and so on so this then is the going back to this idea of the simple 
uh, flowing robes, white for purity, white for simplicity, um, very uh, common materials, andien and cotton, as opposed to the, you know, the very rich materials um, wore by the Ancien Regime. Remember we talked about the importance of colours as representation of status and pattern. So you get no patterns, no colours, and simple materials, simple lines. So this represents then the return to purity and the return to nature uh, preached by Rousseau. Uh, and remember that it was ironic that of course one of the people who had tried to make fashionable the idea of this simple chemise was of course Marie Antoinette, uh, but who had um, totally misinterpreted the way in which she was being represented. Now getting back to Josephine. Josephine um, as the citizeness Bonaparte, right, she's gone from being, you know, this little Creole girl, then she was, the, you know, the Vicomtesse de Beauharnais, uh, divorced, and now she becomes the citizeness Beauharnais. Doesn't save her, and she's put into the calm prison. Now, the calm prison was the, the worst of the revolutionary prisons at the time, and, th and what we have here is one of the um, September riots, when one of the, the crowds actually lusting for blood and to get rid of these uh, clerics and aristocrats go in and summarily haul people out and beat them to death uh, and then undress them and sell their clothes now and it, it this i cannot emphasize enough this symbolism of clothes it was what represented um, prestige what represented the otherness um, of the other class so people were constantly disrobed that's what remember what happened with Marie Antoinette at the Tuileries people came in they didn't care about the priceless furniture the glasses they wanted the dresses they wanted to tear them up or sell them or wear them anyway this is one of these great massacres where people were beaten up and she was then placed in the prison not at that time but later now, um, she, this was a time of every day, of course, the, there would be uh, a roll call of people who were going to be beheaded the next day. And she was actually very lucky because um, some, one of the people whom she had networked through her life was the person who actually was writing the list of people and he used to always put her at the bottom and she managed to survive virtually uh well she did survive uh she i think she was going to be guillotined the day after um robespierre was guillotined so she survived by the, the skin of her teeth but in the meantime she was in a cell um she's got her you know her everything's filthy there's no toilets i mean every there's this extraordinary promiscuity terrible food she has, everyone's having wild love affairs because i think they're going to be uh, killed the next day. She has a long-standing affair with Osh. Her husband's in the next cell or, and something come, comes in and has an affair with the woman who's in the same cell. So it was really a horrible place. And she also became um, very, very ill uh, and uh, with some kind of gynecological sort of infection. It was probably this that um, stopped her from being able to um, have children when she uh, emerges from the, the prison. She would still only be in her 30s, uh, but she seemed to have gone into premature menopause for some reason, probably the, the, the horror um, and the stress of living there. Well, um, she manages to um, survive, uh, and the, the society, after the guillotining of Robespierre, there's an almost immediate reaction of extraordinary relief and this sort of cathartic sort of activities take place. Um, first of all, as I mentioned before, we have an establishment of a totally new regime um, of the five directors, the directeur, and immediately, what do they do? They get the great painter David to design clothes for them, all right? So clothes matter at every stage, you know, to show a new regime. And what does it do? It goes back to this vaguely ridiculous um, mixture of ancien regime, um, gold and silver, uh, with uh, sort of vague overtones of the Renaissance. Now, the person who was the most uh, influential of this group was Barras, uh, who was known for the kind of orgies that um, took place uh, in his house. Now, I just want to talk about this, this time. It, as I said, it was a time of great people had thrown off the fear of, of, of being guillotined. You're at a time when no family um, was, was exempt for having some member 
um, passed through the guillotine. The, the streets literally ran with blood. So um, immediately you have these dances and these uh, restaurants that are, that are set up. Uh, it's a society where all moral values virtually have gone. People still live for the next day. And you get the fashions which uh, suddenly uh, reflect this. And I just wanted to show you this. These are people um, cavorting uh, in the streets. Um, as I said, garde vous, you know, look out. Um, here are women, look at this extraordinary outfit here. These are the um, Ankoya, we'll talk about them in a moment. Um, particularly sexual or mores were no longer respected. People were sort of, uh, you know, had very sort of lax idea of matrimonial vows, etc. And uh, here, of course, uh, while this woman's sort of managing to engage this fellow's attention, his pockets are being picked and so on. Now, uh, people were actually trying to come to terms with the violence of society. And one of the uh, clubs or balls that um, was there was called the Ball of the Victims, the Victims Ball. And um, the only people who could get into the ball had to be able to show that they'd had a relative who'd been guillotined. And also there was a, a certain dress that you adopted. And the first one was this extraordinarily short hairdo, which was cut right up at the back, which um, was the way in which your relatives would have had their hair shorn off um, just before they went to the guillotine. You know, they didn't want the guillotine getting messy, I suppose, so they made sure that your neck was, was nicely exposed. So this hairdo, which was called coiffure à la victime, you can see the hair cut right up the, up the back. And of course, no powder, no wigs, uh, very simple. Um, the other thing you can see, the reference to Greek, Greece and Rome, but um, I couldn't actually find a slide that showed it, but people used to actually wear a red ribbon around their neck, which was to sort of show where the, um, the blade had been. And so in many ways, it's a reference to that last image of, of Marie Antoinette with the red, it becomes a fashion statement to have a red ribbon around your, your neck. Also, you actually had red ribbons, so it sort of X marks the spot over the back of your dress. Now, people danced like this, and instead of saying hello, they just use their, they develop <laughs> this. That was, so it was an extremely sort of morbid way um, of greeting. Uh, people had dinner parties sitting on coffins uh, and, and so on. Um, now, um, there's a whole group of people now who are called the Merveilleurs and the Incroyables, the Unbelievables, uh, and the Marvellous Ones. The Marvellous Ones are the women. Now, this is um, a, an English cartoon with sort of full dress <laughs> because, <laughs> uh, in fact, of course, uh, they are literally undressed. Now, I mean, the chemise has now got to the point where the idea was to wear as little as possible. Uh, in fact, they got to a stage where the costume often was only um, weighed about eight ounces or something. So you used to wear diaphanous clothing. Um, so this, again, was this idea of simplicity back to nature, pushing it a bit far, because, of course, in the, in the French winter, there's a huge number of people dying of pneumonia and so on. And uh, the English doctors, were, at least the French doctors, were getting quite worried because um, of what was happening to women. So this is French undress, as you can see. The men actually went even further, and I'll just um, show you this picture of them here and then here. Now, these men were called the incroyables, the unbelievables, and because, but they actually elided the R. So again, speech matters. Why didn't they want to use an R? Because R is for revolution. So every word that has an R in it, you elide it. So they were the incroyables and the merveilleuses, not the merveilleuses. And so whenever anyone would say something like that, they'd say, oh, they say incroyables. Uh, so this was these, it was a, these dandies um, who actually were thugs, all right? They were dandified thugs who went around um, in completely different dress from that of the revolution, all right? This is an absolute swing around from the, the sans culotte and the Phrygian hat and the cockades. So they've gone back to this elaborate style of dressing. They wore a redingot, which is this short, uh, uh, they often wore a corset, uh, again, going back to constriction, this idea of, of structure, um, very large lapels, often three or four waistcoats underneath, all in different patterns. Uh, and the idea was to look as, as ridiculous as possible. So. Um, they actually had, uh, underneath their cravat, they actually had a cushion 
uh, and then um, a couple of cravats and then a scarf. So it looked as though you had a goiter. Uh, then, of course, the idea was that you um, always walked around with a magnifying glass and stared at people through the magnifying glass to make out you were partially blind. And then the back of the Redding God actually had a thing sticking out to make it look as though you were hunchbacked. And then they had their stockings all crinkled to look as though they didn't have any, any nice calves because one of the sexiest things in the Alcea Magic, well, this is what the idea was, was that well, you looked at men's calves of their legs like, oh, he's nice. Uh, so uh, this was, was really interesting, the calves of men's legs, and that's why they had these short pants, whereas now these people deliberately go against that and have these crinkled, multicoloured stockings. So um, um, also they have their hair cut at the back right up or in a comb, in other words, like the uh, revolutionary haircut ready for the guillotine, but they have it grown down the front like dog ears or, or spaniel ears. Now, they weren't just fops, they were actually armed thugs, and they used to walk around the streets with a cudgel, which they used to call their um, executionary uh, implement. You can see, the, see the, 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 the stockings and things, and the, their knees often sticking out, uh, and would beat up anyone who looked like a jackal bone, right? So it was an exact reversal of what had happened a couple of years before under, uh, the, uh, under the terror of Robespierre. Now, you get the English, of course, having a field day with this. I mean, here we have Les Invisibles, the Invisibles, because <laughs> you now get the hats. I mean, this, this, again, it's excess. I mean, it's a total swing around before you will come to a style which actually um, embodies the idea um, of the consulate under Napoleon, all right? So this is this intermediate period between the revolution and between Napoleon where there really no one is in charge and you can see it in the clothes. Uh, it, it's very interesting. All right, everyone's wearing anything at all, you know, op shops, forget it. I mean, this is much better. Um, here you've got, the, look at the hats. Um, the bonnets come out like this so you can't actually see the face and so on. Now, um, at this time, you are starting to get the development of, well, we saw that fashion magazines started under Marie Antoinette, they're, they're becoming more popular, and once uh, uh, Josephine becomes a, a fashion plate, or becomes the leader of fashion, um, these will have to be published every five days because she spends so much time at her dressmaker with the new fashions, the new styles, that uh, the, the press can't keep up with it, and so they have to go with this extremely fast uh, rotation rate. But but here then we have the Journal des Dames et des Modes showing this um, elegant style um, again. Now it's all very well if you've got long legs, long limbs, long neck, practically no bust. I don't know what I'd look like in this, but it was something that when we talk about Josephine, it suited her very well. Um, now the problem was, of course, that because these women were basically undressed, uh, uh, it was hard to tell whether they were actual, actually prostitutes or, or um, you know, ladies of, 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 of great virtue. But one thing that they began to have to wear underneath it, because it became very obvious, you could see everything, they wore pink tights. You can actually see this here. So they're actually pink uh, flesh-coloured tights um, coming up to the top, and I'll show you later on. And this is another cartoon. Oh, if only he could see. Well, of course he could see. And the dog, even the dog's catching an eyeful. Um, this is this extraordinarily light material uh, and there's virtually nothing underneath. All right, now it's about this time that um, Josephine um, has become the mistress of Barras. Um, Barras um, was bisexual. He spent as much time with um, men as he did with women, so she had a considerable amount of time to go to the dressmaker. Uh, but she was, um, she managed during the time she was in, in, uh, in prison, as well as the time when she was in the convent, to network people. And her fellow prisoners will serve her in great stead in her rise to becoming the, the fashion person of the Directoire. Well, here we have an English uh, cartoon again by Rawlinson showing Barras as this, you know, debauched character, watching Madame Tellien and Josephine dancing naked uh, behind a curtain, and you have this funny little man peeping through, and of course this is no one else but our friend uh, Napoleon Bonaparte. Now, uh, Bonaparte at this time had risen through, he was a scholarship boy, as you know, from the minor nobility of Corsica, came in through scholarships, had come through the ranks, and because of the uh, 
the, the Revolutionary Army, having got rid of the aristocrats, there were places in the hierarchy for men of talent uh, and ambition. And he had begun his rise through at the time of the Directoire. He'd taken a great, he'd won a great victory at Toulon. Now he's a scruffy, unpresupposing person. I think this is one of my favourite paintings by David of him. He's unrecognisable uh, when you think of the caricature that we have of that puffy little paunchy person who is supposed to be Napoleon later on. Now he meets um, Josephine at, uh, he's invited by Barras. Barras needs uh, someone, the directoire, it looks as though it's stumbling. It needs, as they call him, a sword. And they need someone from the army and they decide that they'll be able to manipulate this little fellow. And so he is brought into this um, who's who of the Parisian dinner party scene. And He's absolutely amazed. He's been sleeping on the floor, basically giving all his money to his family. You know, he's got five or seven brothers and sisters and a, and a mother to support. Um, someone who has no star whatsoever, you know, the social graces of a porcupine. And suddenly he's sort of brought into this ex extraordinary atmosphere with the tinkling of crystal glasses, this diaphanous curtains, beautiful velvets, wonderful carpets, the music. And women at this time danced in their diaphanous clothes and the men watched. And he he meets no one else but, of course, uh, Rose, who is Rose uh, de Beauharnais. She's not Josephine yet. He's absolutely enchanted by her, um, simply because she was someone who was uh, who set out to enchant most people, and she always to give them her utmost attention. But they actually had a lot in common. Um, well, first of all, before even talking about what they had in common, is that. The, the Napoleon that you don't know it was a very romantic young man. He actually was a writer. Uh, he wrote his own novels. He was extremely versed in Greek and Roman love poetry and so on. And he wrote his own novel where he was the sort of romantic hero and she was this romantic heroine. He was attracted to her really because she was the it girl. Everybody wanted to be with Rose de Beauharnais. Uh, she was sort of this magnet of, of, of attraction. And so, of course, someone ambitious like him wanted to be in her sights as well. But they had a lot in common. They'd both actually come from islands outside France. Um, if you remember that Corsica had only just become French by a couple of years, in fact I think it was months, um, otherwise it would have been British territory, and the same thing with uh, Martinique. So they both came from these small islands from minor nobility and had suffered humiliation at the hands of the, in, the French aristocracy. Napoleon was mocked by his fellow, pup, fellow pupils at the college at Brienne and she of course, um, as we've, we've learned, um, had been humiliated by uh, Beauharnais and his clique. So they had quite a bit in common, a sort of certain dislike of the French hierarchy uh, and a, a real decision to take their revenge and both great survivors uh, and networkers. Now, what did he see in her? Well, she was seven years older than him, and I mean, that was uh, enormous at those times. By this time, she was nearly 30, and you know, people were usually grandmothers and one and a half feet in the grave by that age. Uh, and you never married someone younger than you, um, older than you. She had two children as well. Uh, she was divorced, uh, but she uh, represented the old world, the old aristocracy, and Bonaparte already at this time had this idea that he was going to be the next star on the international scene. And he was, he was clever enough, in fact extremely clever, but he realised even at this early age that he wasn't going to be able to make it simply as a, uh, a general, simply by defeats. He's going to need someone who can network for him and network amongst those, the cast of the Ancien Régime that he must recuperate if he's going to get enough support because he doesn't simply trust um, the revolutionaries uh, that he came to power with. So this really, I suppose, is one reason. And he's, at, he's head over heels in love with her as well. He's had absolutely no sort of, um, you know, knowledge of women at all, a couple of prostitutes and that's it. And he writes these absolutely sort of um, scorching letters. And I, I feel really sorry for him because imagine you love letters sort of stuck in the library with an academic sitting there sort of going through them thinking, oh, yes, you know. So you really do feel, but he writes, you know, I wake filled with your amazing, indeed sweet and incomparable Josephine is the effect you've wrought within my heart and elsewhere. Um, now, Rose at this time was the incarnation 
of the directoire, the, the freedom, uh, the, the power of w women had come back as being the kind of the centre of the social scene as they had been under the, you know, the Salonniere. And this is the style that you have. Now, it's, um, they have done away completely with wigs, done away with powder. The idea is simplicity. Uh, and so people have their own hair colour. Uh, and I've got this statue from uh, a Greco-Roman frieze, and you can see how the hairdo is very much, uh, uh, you know, a um, duplication of that. Now, as I said before, Rose was extremely elegant. Um, she had long, she had very small breasted, long neck, long arms. And so she looked enchanting in these particular styles. She sort of walked with great uh, grace. And in fact, people always talk about her grace and, and her charm. Um, now, she becomes w the it girl um, of the directoire with three other women. Yes, three other women. The first one is Thérèse Tallien. Now, Tallien, her husband, um, well, she's an interesting woman. She started off as Thérèse Carabas, a Spaniard, married a banker, had five children, left him for the great General Tallien, who was responsible for getting rid of uh, Robespierre, uh, then leaves him promptly, uh, has a few more children, uh, then marries another wealthy banker. So she ends up with this extraordinary number of ex-husbands, lovers and children everywhere and still manages to look amazing. <laughs> mm, so we won't dwell on her too much, right? <laughs> now, um, these, uh, it's, it's very interesting that you have the paintings of these women and you can see them at the Musée Carnavalet. So they were, they were painted because they were someone at the time. It wasn't her family that had commissioned these, these paintings. And here, of course, you have the Greco-Roman style um, with the uh, Greek uh, stole and the Greek pattern. And you can see very, very plain colours and very little patterning on this than the uh, very simple hairdos. Now, um, the Greco-Roman style was, uh, was, was spoken about before this is the way in which it's produced with the, with the stoles and the, the the ornamentation down here but also um, what happened if you didn't have enough hair to wear for the Greco-Roman style that you also began to wear wigs for these parties so um, Josephine and these other women, these three other women, used to get together and say, well, you know, what wig are we going to wear tonight? We'll all wear the same thing, you know, these sort of girl -eek type things. And they used to um, actually have wigs, all of which were blonde in different styles and come along in exactly the same wig and so on. Um, but in, for general, general life, except for these extraordinary dress-up balls, people um, wore unpowdered hair. This was um, a great friend of Josephine's who was, they were absolute goers, these women. They really were, I mean, Fortune Amla, she, you know, she'd often um, start out with three dresses, one over the top, and by the end of the evening she'd have nothing on at all. Uh, it was really quite extraordinary to be dancing with nothing on. Uh, in the end they had to sort of have, uh, you know, legislation to ban this kind of behaviour. But the one that you're probably most familiar with is Madame de Récamier, uh, who was this very pure, you know, she was known for her purity. Uh, she had a number of admirers, in fact, amongst them the great writer, romantic writer, uh, René de Chateaubriand, um, all who adored her right until the end of her life. And she managed to keep her, her, herself nice uh, and away from um, the crowds. Now, um, she's painted, this is by uh, Gérard, she's also painted by David. Um, but you see the importance of this very simple undress which hovers um, with great difficulty between being brazen undress and simple, uh, you know, femininity. Uh, and you can see it's just hovering between the two of them there with this sort of falling off her shoulder. Um, the style also is for these shawls because of course you, you really couldn't survive in, in France or in Paris in the winter, wearing a couple of layers of muslin. Uh, so these were, became very important and they would um, be a major part of Josephine's wardrobe. So these then are the women who are extremely important. Now fashion changes quickly, as I said. Um, Josephine every day is, is wearing you know, a, different, a different outfit. Um, and the outfits um, change a little bit according to what is happening politically. Right here you get the wars, um, you have the, uh, uh, this is an outfit where they've suddenly added a bonnet and extra bits and pieces. This is reference to military outfits uh, and so on. Now, uh, 
Rose, at least Joseph, uh, what, what did Josephine see in, in Napoleon? Why did she decide that she would marry him? Well, she didn't really want to. She thought he was a really scruffy little number. But uh, she was a woman who was aging. Uh, she was in her 30s. Uh, Rouge couldn't do it for her eternally. Uh, and she had no income at all. Um, her husband's income had, had been taken by the state. She had uh, the, uh, the, the sugar fields over in Martinique had failed miserably. The slave trade had been abolished. Um, she was someone who had no resources and she had two young children. So after a long consultation with her friends, she decides that she'll marry him. She also misleads the poor darling by saying that she's awfully wealthy. And he finds out virtually the, the day before that she isn't, but it's too late. So um, he, they're, they're married, uh, and he gives her a little uh, medallion with To Destiny written on the back of it. And he really was a very superstitious, romantic character at this time. Um, and two days later, goes off to the military campaigns in, uh, in Italy and carries off resounding victories. But one of um, Josephine's friends says, what, marry a general is nothing but his cloak and sword, but he lives in a den or a hovel, doesn't he? And uh, when uh, Napoleon is actually crowned emperor at Notre Dame, he, at the end of the ceremony, he goes up to this fellow and he says, some cloak, some sword, eh? <laughs> <laughs> All right, now this is Rose at the time. Now, um, Napoleon had some strange attitudes towards women. In France, women are far too much of. They should not be regarded as men's equals, for after all, they're nothing but the machinery for turning out of children. The greatest woman is she who has the largest family. And this is probably in reference to his mother, who had had a huge number of children. But he was sort of renowned for his sort of sexist comments. You know, for example, if a woman who looked rather buxom, he'd come up and stare down her cleavage and say, well, um, it's nice to know that you, you obviously breastfed all your children, madam, now cover yourself up. Or um, the other thing he would say would go up to someone and sort of say, well, I'd heard you were ugly, but you know, they didn't exaggerate, did they? And this, <laughs> this really, I mean, talk about winning friends and influencing people. And this is why he needed someone like uh, Josephine. Now, um, he goes off to uh, the campaign in Egypt, and this is going to be a turning point uh, in their relationship. I don't want to talk about their relationship very much, but it is quite important uh, in the way in which he will actually decide to keep her as his wife and not get rid of her because he sees her as very useful uh, in being able to embody the style of the new France that he w wishes to put forward. You know, he's g he has this idea already he's going to be emperor uh, and he knows that she can do it as empress. Um, while she's away, while he's away winning victories, this is actually um, a propaganda painting that he produces, um, the, the pest, the plague breaks out and he has him, shows himself here going to visit the plague victims at Jaffa. Um, great propaganda painting the French flag fluttering the background, France has taken civilization to the east, um, but he doesn't show himself as a soldier, he shows himself as a medical man, these are doctors behind him, touching um, the, uh, the sick, and this is very much a Christ-like gesture, so he's already trying to represent himself as something more than just a very good general. But from our story, what is of, of interest is that while he's there, um, because uh, Josephine had no intention of stopping having her affairs. In fact, she'd met a dashing young man called Hippolyte Charles, a uh, dragoon who looked fantastic in his outfit. And she was having a long running uh, affair with him. And he was the lover with whom she would set up a business to um, work on the supplies of the great army. Uh, it's well known, everyone knows that she's having an affair. And finally, the Bonaparte family, who have never um, agreed with uh, Napoleon marrying a woman who was, so they considered just a courtesan, who was divorced, who had children, who was older, uh, spendthrift and so on, um, decide they go to definitely try and get rid of her and send word over to Napoleon that, uh, about Josephine's affairs. And he's, he's absolutely devastated. Um, it's corroborated by Josephine's son, who is actually with him as aide de camp. And Napoleon writes back a letter sort of repudiating her, saying, how could you do this? This is the end. This is divorce. And as fate will have it, um, unfortunately, um, his letter was intercepted by a British pirate ship. And the British was not great chivalry, published it in their newspapers. So um, Bonaparte becomes the cuckold of Europe. So that really didn't improve matters at home, but he was determined to divorce her. But during this time, she has already begun her overspending, and the overspending of which she is notorious and um, was true, but it was 
understandable in the context of someone who has constantly been on the verge of bankruptcy. And so when she finally does have some money, she sort of splurges it to um, actually try and have some kind of collateral, I suppose, in case hard times come again. So she wildly overspends on this little chateau, which was actually a country house on the outskirts of, of Paris called Malmaison. And she has herself her portrait done here by Prudent. And here you will, this really is the style that she will make famous, which is known as the empire style, but it's actually a misnomer because we're under the consulate. At the, we're not even under the consulate, I suppose, with the beginning of the consulate. It's this um, diaphanous dress, which is elegant, which falls beautifully, which moves beautifully. And one of the things about Josephine was her movement. Um, the tiny little sleeves, as you will see in a moment actually, which are attached to, it, it's actually worn with a, a kind of a corset, but the sleeves impede your movement. So you've got these dainty little delicate, you know, movements. You can't sort of, you know, get your arm up like that. So the whole thing is this delicacy, this femininity, fragility, uh, and so on, uh, and the idea of, of purity going back to nature. But also here you have the romantic aspects which are beginning to be prevalent at, in Paris at the end of the 18th century, you know, man, the melancholy of life and so on. I just wanted to have a, quickly have a look at, this is the place that she will build, extraordinarily modern, the decor. If you think this was built in, what, eight, uh, seven, no, 17, 98 or something, uh, it really could be the flaws and everything could be in our days. Now she develops, um, she was extremely careful of how she looked. Uh, uh, later on, she, when she has realised that she has to hold on to Napoleon, um, she spends hours and hours and hours with her makeup uh, and changes her perfume exactly the way he wants it, changes her clothes, goes to bed with the corset, get fully made up, gets up before he's there fully made up, uh, and so on, does absolutely everything to maintain her position because she's realised that he is a man on the rise and he's worth um, holding on to. Uh, Napoleon, for his part, makes a sort of statement, nothing but becomes a woman so much as tears and rouge, right? And uh, tears were great, very important at this time. You know, everyone cried. You know, this is the time of, of Rousseau and sensitivity and imagination. And tears showed that you were in tune with nature, that you weren't just a mind, that you were very sensitive. So Voltaire cried, Rousseau cried. You cried if you were happy, overcome. And she, Josephine, had managed to make an art of it, you know, had the tears coming one by one down the cheek. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't the red nose and the runny and the runny <laughs> mascara. It was, you know, she managed, this worked a charm with Napoleon because I think probably he was a bit of a sadist. All right, well, um, Malmaison, she continues in many ways what uh, May Antoinette had begun, this idea of the English garden, which changes according to seasons, um, which doesn't have the rigid structure of the French garden, uh, the different um, types of foliage, the different green, the different textures, the different, you know, three trees as opposed to two, a very, very harmonious um, uh, environment where you, it leads you to think of nature, of one's place uh, in the cosmos. Uh, and it's at this time, I, I'm going to come back and talk about Malmaison a bit at the end, but it's this time she um, manages to get from the Bourdain voyage, which has been sent off by uh, Napoleon in 1800, um, the black swan. Uh, a number of, of animals are brought back, uh, the kangaroo, the emu, uh, are kept alive even when the crew are allowed to die. And she manages to, main, to get hold of these black swans and she makes these her symbol, um, mainly because they're so cutting edge, you only have white swans in Europe. But also the, the neck looks like the J of the cipher of Josephine. And also at the time, um, people thought that swans only had one mate for life. This was the idea. In fact, they've only just found out the last year that they don't. But um, in fact, it's the, the, the female swans who go off and, and moonlight a bit. Um, but this um, is part of this idea that she had of pulling out all stops, um, even symbolically, uh, to maintain her attachment to uh, Napoleon. Uh, when Napoleon comes home from um, the Egyptian campaign, uh, the first thing he does is try to, he throws all her goods out onto the street uh, and she arrives late, she's been off with her lover somewhere else and 
prostrates herself on the stairs, cries and sobs, cries and sobs. No, nope, he's not going to open the door. Finally brings in her two children, uh, Hortense and Eugène. And it's worth remembering when you hear about the sort of stories about Napoleon, he was an extremely affectionate um, stepfather. Uh, he was only about seven years older than his stepson anyhow, and it's from the entreaties of the two children to their stepfather that he actually allows Josephine back in again, and they take up. However, the uh, dynamic of the relationship has changed completely. She now is, she has to hold on to him. She's subject, you know, submissive to him, and he now has really been so disillusioned that he will never, ever forgive her. And it's the beginning of what will become the divorce later on. But in the meantime, um, she now um, takes on this official role as wife of the first consul and he needs to represent himself. And so here we have her already developing a style which um, has now gone beyond that style of the directoire. Right? Remember with the sort of ridiculous outfits and ridiculously diaphanous and so on. So you've, she's kept the essentials of the flowing simple style but um, has added her own touch which is this creole um, sort of veil that she will wear constantly which gives softens her features very much and the um, what she adores are these paisley um or at least these shawls and this is a these cost a fortune and you can see that the shawl actually is part of the dress can you see that and uh, the frill is there at the bottom because you didn't actually want the uh, paisley the uh, shawl to become all tattered uh, now we now get um, official portraits of her uh, and we have the hydrangeas which represent her daughter Hortense, uh, Hortense means hydrangea, uh, her son Eugène and the letter here represents uh, Napoleon who is off winning wars for France. So there's this reference to the absent husband. I'm not sh sure about the littering, what it, what it means there, but um, this is in the background we have Malmaison ruins of course which were very important in the English garden at the time, reference to the passing of time, reference to death and so on. Now, Napoleon um, by now has come back uh, and has been given the position of consul. He immediately becomes first consul and this is the first step to his rise and rise and rise. Now, what is interesting here, and I want you to remember the outfits that Napoleon wears as well, is that he is representing himself here no longer simply as a general, uh, as we saw in that Napoleon at the Bridge of Arcole, but um, as a statesman. So you have a very pared down outfit with, with basically the red against the white and the black boots, so that you've, you've lost all of the bits and pieces, the epaulette and, and so on. And he's attempting to, what he's doing here is pointing to his victories, um, his, the victory at Amiens, uh, the victory of Lunemil, which sets up the Treaty of Amiens, which um, sets up a treaty with Great Britain. Now this was one of the great sort of coups um, that he managed to pull off. So he's pointing to this, I and mean, Napoleon uses art very much for propaganda. Uh, but it's a very, very sort of Spartan sort of structure. He's there and he's looking out the room as if someone has just attracted his attention. He's still the soldier, but he's very much the statesman, the elegant gentleman. So what you've actually got in his costume is structure. And this is what you're actually going to get under the consulate, the political structure of Napoleon. And until he actually goes into these grandiose ideas of, of, uh, of empire, uh, and loses the plot politically and on a military point of view, you'll be able to see it in the plumes and, and his vestimentary outfit. He also at this time has come back from Egypt and uses every way possible of advertising what he has done. Uh, he's a, one of the great spin artists of history. Um, he revives all the luxury industries, in particular um, porcelain uh, at Sèvres, um, but doesn't just want them revived. He wants them to reference his own greatness, and he gives these uh, uh, sets of, of porcelain to other uh, crown heads of Europe. And so every time you're you know, having a cup of tea, uh, you get to the bottom of your cup and my goodness, there's Napoleon in Egypt. Uh, you get to the end of your cake and there he is again. Uh, and uh, you, you know, pour yourself some tea and you've got the reference to the sphinxes and so on. So it's a very, very clever form of propaganda. 
he doesn't just do this on the dinner plates. Um, these weren't plates, by the way, that you ate off. You actually had them next to you, but you had very plain plates. Beautiful things, but all of his victories. And, and of course, you, you cannot imagine how exotic this was at the time. You know, this was the first foray into the Middle East, you know, and he blocked the East for the English. I mean, this was a time of great glory. And he was also fascinated by the culture. In fact, he decided he might be a Muslim at one stage. Um, he also, the city of Paris takes on the physiognomy that it has now, but um, with um, this is at the Châtelet. You'll notice the sphinxes, reference to the, you know his time in Egypt. Um, references here, you've got in big letters all of his victories in Egypt. So you really couldn't walk around um, Paris without being aware of the legacy of our great consul, and it, it is everywhere. I won't go into it any further. Jewelry now um, is also very important uh, in uh, referencing Egypt, and he gets Josephine to start wearing um, clothes which reference also the style, which was called Retour d'Egypte, right? Return from Egypt style. And of course, because she is the fashion plate, because she's the person who sets the style, it spreads like wildfire. Everyone in Paris, all the women, the bourgeois women now, um, want to wear these style, which are the Retour d'Egypte. So it's, it's a fantastic propaganda uh, mechanism. And he'll extend this later on when he becomes emperor through out Europe, right? through clothes, through coins and so on. So here we have this Mamluk. Uh, he actually even brought back some of the Mamluk uh, Egyptians for his servants and they astounded everyone with their outfits. Um, and this, the handbag here fascinates me. It's um, oversized, but you know, probably quite fashionable today. All right, I just wanted to, to look at um, this, this point that I suppose I'm laboring a little bit is, is that you, you can sort of see the way a regime turns by the, the costume. And, from the total unstructuring of the revolutionary outfit, the total, you know, disarray of the incroyable outfit, you're now getting back to a structured um, one under the consulate. And you begin to wear, they now start to wear a kind of corset again. All right, um, and this, of course, is is necessary because um, gravity, you know, does come in at a certain point. And to to have one of these these outfits, which are very cut very low here. Um, after a certain age, you wouldn't be able to wear it. I think we all know what I mean. Uh, and so uh, this um, is, is a kind of, this busk is pushing this up. Now you can see very closely here this um, purse slip, which um, because her teeth had actually gone, and one of the last time I was in Paris, there was actually a, a, a man on the tour who was a, uh, a dental surgeon who works on jaws and he was studying her paintings with great interest and he could say you can you can see that you know she had that sort of you know pulled in cheeks but that was because all of her teeth had gone here and there and one of the reasons she, she always um, had a handkerchief in front of her mouth always spoke with a, a fan or a handkerchief to not offend people uh, by her stumped black stumped teeth you do have to remember that everyone you know dental hygiene wasn't Terrific. I mean, everybody had rotten teeth. It's just that she was worse than most. It's funny to think about it, you know, when she's the epitome of charm. Anyway, all right. Now she begins now to employ um, a couturier uh, and spends a fortune on what she is going to look like. And this man, Leroy, um, takes over from. In fact, Rose Bertin even works with Josephine for a short time. Uh, so Leroy takes over from the position of Bertin and plies Josephine constantly with new outfits. Now, you can see the references here to the east with the turbans, um, references to trade uh, in the islands with these uh, shawls which are brought across. Um, Napoleon then brings in merino, it brings in sheep from Tibet or somewhere so that you can actually manufacture his own shawls and so on. Um, her hats were done by somebody else, Demoiselle L'Olive. Again, you can see reference to these exotic kinds of, of Egyptian uh, headdresses. And her shoes were done by Bottier Cop. Now, the shoes, you see the uh, Eastern influence here, all right, little scuffs. Now, um, these sho Josephine had something like three or four hundred pairs of shoes um, a year. And this is uh, one could explain this because they're made of satin uh, and silk and the soles are made of that as well which means that really basically after having danced the you know the minuet a couple of times um, these shoes are, are totally threadbare 
Um, the other thing that's quite interesting is that you don't have a left foot and a right foot. That's something that comes in quite a bit later. Uh, the shoes are just straight and very, very tiny is that. Now, uh, Josephine uh, really did indulge excessively in her wardrobe. Oh, that's right. Now, the, these clothes were so diaphanous that, of course, you couldn't have pockets. You know, you, you couldn't have nothing on, a pair of tights and then a pocket. Uh, so that's when you get the beginning of these handbags, which are called reticule, which is actually reticulous in Latin, is the word for a small box. So that's where the word reticule comes from, and people, they then put their little, you know, their little watches and different things in the bag. Uh, this is Joseph um, Pauline Bonaparte, uh, Napoleon Bonaparte's sister, wearing this uh, e extraordinary sort of headdress, and you can see the um, kind of undress that uh, is is prevalent at the time. Well, um, in 1804, um, Napoleon feels that he is now in a position to push forward with his lifelong ambition which has been to uh, become an emperor and to establish a dynasty. Uh, and so he crowns himself uh, Napoleon Bonaparte and he wants to institute the Napoleonide dynasty uh, which will be the same as the Bourbon and the Capetien, all right? Of course, there's a slight problem here is that his wife doesn't seem to be able to produce any heirs, even though she says, my dear, it's not my problem. Look, I've got two beautiful children. So he's a little bit anxious about this. Uh, but his sister will, in fact, the Bonaparte clan will make sure that they get him a mistress and he will um, definitely have a child. And so at that stage, he realises that he can have children and that really is the death knell of Joseph. Josephine. However, um, he decides that she has been with him through these very, very difficult years and he wants to make her empress. He will divorce her very soon afterwards, about 18 months afterwards, but he really feels that he owes it to her to keep with her at this time. But I want to just bring, um, refer you now to this change of costume that we've seen with Napoleon. He's now the emperor, all right? And this is a return to the luxurious, over-the-top kinds of uh, clothes that you would have had under the Ancien Regime. From that engaging young general with his hair flying in the wind to the statesman uh, with his sword and his, his gloves, we now have someone who has taken on a, a kind of esoteric, a hard, iconic um, vision of authority. He's thoroughly frightening, he is um, unapproachable, he's very much like a Greek icon. Now what he has done here, he pulls out all stops, he pr produces himself as a legitimate descendant of the kings of France, right, he has the, the sword of just, Charlemagne's sword, the hand of justice, um, but he also produces himself as a Roman emperor with the laurel wreath and he's seated in a throne like Jupiter, but he's also very um, superstitious and uh, he's interested he, on the carpet, apart from the eagle, which is his emblem, you see the signs of the zodiac, which were in the, in the sky at the times of his greatest victories, in particular, the victory of Austerlitz. So he really, this is a kind of conglomeration of all of these artistic styles pulled together and it is now this iconic, frightening figure. He crowns himself in this massive ceremony at Notre Dame. He cannot, he's not a true royal, so therefore he can't be crowned at Reims, at Reims, but he will have in attendance the Pope. And the Pope is told at the last minute that he will not be crowning him. Napoleon crowns himself. However, he's shrewd enough to know that with it, for having a great propaganda painting, which, for which he will pay thousands of euros to David to execute, which shows that Napoleon realised the importance of art, uh, thousands and thousands of, of, of euros to, to produce this. Uh, he asks David to portray him at the moment when he crowns Josephine as empress. So right? this doesn't look quite so arrogant as putting the crown on your own head. Now, again, a great propaganda painting. His mother wasn't there because she was cross with him. She, she, uh, she was in Rome with the younger son, and uh, Napoleon says to David, paint her in anyhow. All right, now we've got um, all of the... It's, these are basically um, 
now portraits of the new court, the new nobility. This is his family lined up here. His sisters who absolutely hate Josephine, who are actually going to drop her train as she stands up to receive the crown. And Napoleon has to yell out in Corsican, pick it up, you little so-and-sos. Um, we have all of the court here, Talleyrand and so on. Now, um, what he has asked David to do also now is to return to um, the medieval style, the Renaissance style. The, the last queen who was ever crowned um, had been Mary de Medici, and so here you have Mary de Medici here being crowned uh, in the at Reims. So this then, the, this particular painting is a reference to placing him amongst the great dynasties of France's history. Um, and he uses the style that he asks David to create. It's Isabelle and David are the people who design the costumes with Leroy working with them. Um, are very much Renaissance style on top of uh, the Empire style. Do you see what I mean? You've, you've got the sort of the straight lines, but all of the decoration um, references the Renaissance. Um, here you've got this sort of uh, Queen Elizabeth style. Uh, don't uh, lace collar, uh, long sleeves which come down here and are held in place by pieces of elastic. Would they have elastic then? Or anyhow, pieces of ribbon. Um, and Napoleon does this deliberately to stimulate the luxury um, market because uh, lace work, the beautiful material work, the um, embroidery work, all had fallen in a heap with uh, the exit. Uh, of the uh, aristocracy. So he's trying to stimulate this and by having Josephine dressed like this when she is crowned, hoping that this style will go throughout Europe and that all of Europe will buy the materials manufactured by the French. And it actually does happen. There is a huge um, stimulus to the French economy. Uh, just another painting of her in a different outfit and I'll be talking about these uh, crowns. Unfortunately, I'm going to go a little bit over. Do you, do you mind? No? All right. Um, look, I'll just quickly go through this. Now, um, court dress now imitates what uh, his regime is about. Well, we've gone from simplicity of the revolution, now back to a style um, of almost of the Ancien Regime, where yards and yards of material are required, where these incredibly long trains are required for court attendance, just as they were at the time of Marie Antoinette. Um, I've just got several pictures of Josephine's clothes, simply out of self-indulgence, I can't help myself. Um, we now have very much this, uh, what is called the empire line, underneath the dress, underneath the bust, um, but all of that um, nakedness is gone. Now, Napoleon deliberately uh, wanted to get away from this. He, being a good Corsican, he thought this was absolutely outrageous and, in fact, blocked up um, chimneys in the great houses where balls were given um, so that women would either freeze to death or be forced to wear more clothes. Uh, and so you can see that this style remains, but it has now become extremely elaborate. All right, we've gone back to the luscious materials, and you know, the, the, the white muslin really is no longer good enough. Uh, and certainly he didn't want um, Josephine wearing muslin, which might have been imported from England. I mean, she made the mistake of doing that one day, and he just picked up his inkwell and threw ink all over her. So I'm not quite sure why I admire him so much, really, on this <laughs> um, But anyway, um, so we've got these long sleeves and the very heavily embroidered train, speaking of royalty. This is her, her again, another one, still in very pale colours that she will um, always champion. I like these paintings because this is the interior of Madame Maison, and this is her bedroom, which is um, very, very simple with beautiful colours. The colours don't come out here. They're a kind of pale, pale gold with a very, very pale... Um, sort of mauve, most unusual. I, I, you can actually see it on some porcelain I'll show you later. So as you can see, very long, elaborate um, uh, dresses. And this again is Malmaison. The stucco here is in pale grey. You've got this black and white uh, check uh, floors. Very, very elegant uh, decor. Well, um, this then is Josephine. Now, um, what is going to happen now is the materials and are going to become more and more elaborate until they are so elaborate that they interfere with the line uh, of the empire style. Uh, so in other words, you're now getting a, dis or a lack of equilibrium between the style and its, its, its production. And it really, in many ways, I think, shows exactly what's happening 
uh, in politics at the time, all right? Where now uh, Napoleon has sort of overstretched himself, he's overstretched the army, uh, and Will is really going towards his own defeat. Um, to some degree, you're going to see this appearing in the costume, which is trying to be something that it never really can be. Well, I just wanted to very quickly um, look at this ghastly sort of uh, Napoleonic family that Josephine uh, got herself into. Um, these are the siblings, the mother, Laetitia, who was known as Madame Mother, Madame Mayor. I rather like that. Yeah, I think, yes, I think I could go with that, Madame Mother. Um, is, is represented here as an aristocrat with her feet on a cushion. Remember those um, paintings where you always had to have the king giving you legitimacy? Well, here, of course, you don't have the king, but you've got Napoleon as um, a Roman emperor, the Roman emperor Augustus, whom he identified with. So she, she was actually known for being a beauty. She had her first child at 14, uh, had 10 children, and her husband died probably fortuitously in many ways, and uh, she had to bring up these eight children by herself. Now, she was an extremely austere, um, tough, hard-living woman who'd, who'd had to scrape and save and do the best by her family, and she was outraged when uh, her, her Nabulioni, as she called him, uh, brought home uh, this profligate uh, bit of fluff. And really, you know, what would any Italian mother think? You know, seven years old, already divorced children, etc. Oh dear. Uh, so uh, the, she actually was always very civil, but wanted him to do the right thing. Um, he had three sisters, the, the eldest one being Elisa, whom, all of whom he will establish on thrones throughout Europe. And this is really what I'm trying to say. And now this, um, to some degree, upstart family um, is suddenly cast as royalty and they don't have the talent of their brother. One or two of them aren't too bad, but the rest of them are basically a squabbling rabble, all worried about who has precedence, who does this, she got more jewels than I did, but I'm only a princess, why aren't I a queen, and so on. And very jealous of the role that Josephine had in the court of the time, if, it, if not in the heart of their brother. Um, so you can see now the way in which he, Napoleon is exporting this image, which Josephine has put together, but which she loses control of under Napoleon because he wants it to look more and more elaborate. And you can see now um, there's much more structure. You've noticed that um, it no longer just flows. Um, you've got every possible kind of, of, of jewellery and bits and pieces. Look at all of this. I mean, there's stripes and then you've got circles and then you've got pearls and then you've got lace. I mean, it's, it's all happening. Uh, and an extraordinary abundance of jewellery. Almost, you would almost sort of say a little bit new rich. All right, so this is Elisa who becomes Duchess of Tuscany. Um, his other notorious sister, Pauline, who was sort of a bit the Paris Hilton, I suppose, of the time. Napoleon actually sort of sang at a family reunion who his sisters met. Um, how can I be Emperor of Europe with you cavorting round, you know, the way it is? She even managed to have herself sculpted naked by Canova. But here again, the sort of the, the royal painting sort of lost it, losing the plot again. You've got this gigantic Napoleon, the le legitimacy to her. She started, she ended up as the Princess Borghese. Uh, and uh, that is the collection that you have in Rome. Um, again, uh, the back to incredibly rich materials, even though it's still in pale colours, you know, with reference to the Muslim, Muslim <coughs> colours, um, it's by now very structured and overly ornate. Uh, this is her again. Uh, this is his third sister, Pauline, whom he marries off strategically to his greatest general, Murat, who is the great cavalry, great six foot three, absolute sort of, you know, meathead, but very brave. Probably hadn't figured out that if he charged 100 miles an hour, he might be killed. I don't, he, was, he wasn't actually known for his intelligence. Anyway, um, it was, uh, he was married off to this young girl when she was about 15, and they became king and queen of Naples, uh, and became so imbued with their own royalty and re didn't want to lose um, their power when it looked as though their brother was going to be defeated at Waterloo, and did a deal with the British whereby they actually let the British into the Bay of Naples, uh, which uh, uh, hastened their, her brother's uh, um, defeat at Waterloo. The British themselves were quite amazed. So many of the, this is what they were like. They were squabbling and turning against each other. But I just wanted to show you, by now, this over-the-top uh, return to regal um, uh, structure. This is the youngest brother, Jérôme, who Napoleon forced to divorce his first wife because she wasn't someone who could be used as a pawn in his game. 
but again huge reference to um, the kingship and you know it's almost like a baroque painting with the curtain and you know his kingdom out the window and so on now I just wanted to very quickly and I'm sorry about this um, look at um, the jewelry that uh, Josephine amassed now um, Napoleon went at this time right up to the empire from victory to victory throughout um, Italy in particular and rather than actually ask for um, payment for the you know people to pay what's it called when you yes well you know when you defeat someone and they actually have to give you money tributes thank you um, he took with him um, people who artists and um, antiquarians and they then ransacked all the palaces uh, of the defeated cities and he came back with the most beautiful jewelry now uh, Josephine not being shy in coming forward had her own agents paid on this staff and she always when Napoleon went off she gave him a list of what she wanted uh, in the way of jewelry uh, but Napoleon very carefully worked out what she was going to wear now I wanted to I want to talk very briefly about this tiara um, she became famous for her tiara wearing um, worn very low as you'll see um, but every thing she wore was propaganda right and this one was um, Napoleon had taken these cameos from a great collection uh, in Rome now the cameos reference um, the idea of the ancient world all right because um, this is when they were actually invented when you actually had the side views of the statues this is uh, Venus with love and on the other other side of the crown you have uh, Venus uh, platonic love so by putting these into a crown with stolen uh, pearls and so on um, he is referencing his claim to being the emperor of the ancient world and so when uh, Josephine wears this this is reference to him having conquered uh, and being king of Rome as, as well now this is the crown which will be worn uh, later on I don't know who this is and I think this is now the Queen of Norway uh, and this is worn correctly but it, people who wear them nowadays look vaguely ridiculous because um, the, the hairdo is, is just simply uh, not correct uh, and they were actually made to be worn very very low down on the forehead um, there she is wearing it there now each of these um, outfits or these coronets usually had to go with it a belt which was worn very high uh, usually a necklace uh, earrings and quite possibly a bracelet as well Josephine pioneered a kind of bracelet where you actually had messages in it so for example you had um, a diamond and then a an amethyst and a ruby which spells out darling or something like that yeah. it was a special type of jewelry that she developed right she had boxes of the stuff boxes all right now this um these are the extraordinary jewelry which was um had been taken as loot i suppose and which was never r returned uh and uh th th by now we're actually beginning to use cut uh, uh pieces as well up until during the middle ages of course gems were not cut uh, this is the Queen of Finland actually wearing this now uh, this is another one with the beautiful uh, sapphires and this is the, uh, the what they call the paru where you have the necklet the pendant earrings the small earrings uh, and the brooch as well and this um, I'll just go through these I haven't got time to talk about them uh, this one was actually given um, by uh, the King uh, Alexander of Russia who was the one who defeated Napoleon at the great you know debacle of Moscow um, who remained a great friend of Josephine's after she was divorced um, and went on his one of his final trips brought her this tiara with these beautiful um, cut uh, diamond uh, teardrops now I just wanted to show you um, a few pictures of um, the Queen of Sweden wearing some of these things now uh, as you see the kind of clothes and the makeup and the hairdo that we have now doesn't suit these old-fashioned styles of, of, of jewelry at all in fact they look vaguely ridiculous I mean this really does look like something that she got at Kmart basically <laughs> all right now um, we now have talking of ridiculous um, we, we now move on to Napoleon at the height of empire uh, and as you can see um, this is now a very structured dress uh, covered in gold covered in jewelry and so on and Napoleon has forsaken his 
you know, a very elegant outfit for something which is looking patently absurd, um, all half of the ostrich herd on his head. Now, in, in, in many ways, this, this um, return to show, to, to conspicuous power, um, really shows in many ways how he was already overstepping himself and he had um, lost the sight of the reality of the um, economic and military situation in Europe. There he is uh, when he was a sober young man. Um, his court now um, goes back to these extraordinary costumes. No one could appear, no, you had to wear everything, you had to be different every day. The women weren't allowed to wear the same outfit twice. Here is one of his servants, one of his chamberlains. This is a senator. I mean, they've gone back, as you can see, back to the, the culotte, you know, that we had before, the silk stockings, the, the you know, the lace. Um, here are another kind of senator, and this is another kind of courtier. Um, I just wanted to show you this. Um, there's a huge production also of jewellery at the time, and this was a kind of a clock which was made for um, Josephine, and he gave it to Hortense. It was one of these clocks where you could feel the hand on the outside. It's probably what you're all doing now, thinking, my God, you know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, you can feel that it's going past the hour. All right, well, she finally has decided that he will divorce her. Uh, this is the divorce settlement. She reads out a statement. Everyone cries profusely. Uh, Josephine's son faints. I mean, it's all, it's all <laughs> happening. Uh, and she retires to Malmaison. And she, however, remains two things. She retains the title of Empress, which really is not going to be a tremendously interesting, a good career move for her, because when he remarries, there will be two empresses of Paris one will have to go. And uh, she also retains Malmaison and a huge sum of money to um, be able to continue to develop the plants and the, uh, the gardens that she had begun there. Now, he marries um, Mary Louise of Austria, um, who had been brought up to hate him. I mean, you know, the Austrians were their arch empire. In fact, the whole Vendome column was made of, of melted down um, uh, cannons from his great victory at Austerlitz over her father. So, I mean, it was a bit embarrassing as the sort of, you know, the, the, the uh, coronation cortege goes past this sort of uh, particular column. Anyway, they got through it. But as you can see now, um, the court dress is becoming more and more elaborate. It still has very tenuous links to that very pure style of the consulate style, which in, was the incarnation of the grace and the um, influence of Josephine. It's now becoming um, out of kilter. Um, this is um, a bedroom that he and Napoleon had made up for them at the Chateau de Compiègne. Uh, he, after his divorce with Josephine, he was inconsolable for probably a couple of months and then managed to broker the uh, alliance with the uh, great Duchess of, of, of Austria, the niece of Marie Antoinette. So keen to meet her, he can't even wait in Paris, he has to go and meet her at Compiègne. And this was the bedroom that he'd drawn up or had decorated for Josephine. You can still see these, the um, bed had the sort of cornucopia, which is sort of a bit like the J. Well, anyhow, he just, you know, does a quick redo and it's given over to his second empress. Uh, this is the, uh, what Josephine's bedroom looks like. You can see the simple style uh, and so on. Now, what I actually want to do just quickly, just very quickly, is show you how between consulate and empire, how you've gone from light, delicate, stylish into sort of clunky and over the top. So this is the kind of uh, woodwork uh, that you would have had under Jacob Frere at about 1800, very delicate uh, brass work on inlaid wood. Uh, same thing here, very plain, beautifully worked tables. And then of course you get to the kind of things under the empire, really heavy, ornate, over the top, over representation, right? There's no subtlety left. Um, I want you to have a look at the early um, save. Now, these are the colours that Josephine um, favoured, this pale, pale champagne colour and the very pale mauve um, with a kind of slightly um, Egyptianizing sort of uh, thing. This is a cabaret, which means a set for cups of coffee. And then you get uh, under the empire, this really heavy, um, you couldn't look at a vase without seeing me conquering Egypt, me conquering so on. So they're all of these referencing his defeats. Well, there's Josephine then, probably not looking her best um, after the divorce. Now, um, she now, um, I'm going to very, very quickly talk about Mademoiselle. She now puts her body and soul uh, into 
um, developing La Maison. She's always been fascinated by botany. Um, and this is a reference, this is a, uh, something which lives from the time when she was living in Martinique. And she brings out to uh, the gardens of Malmaison, um, I'll just go back to this one, um, all these exotic species, the camellias, hibiscuses, azaleas, um, all the daphnes, all of these are going to be brought across by her. Um, she is very um, proud of her cutting edge glass houses, uh, which, uh, you know, you're now being able to manufacture panes of glass in larger pieces. And she has all of these plants um, there in her glass house. And particularly, she has a lot of plants from Australia. Now, uh, in 1800, Josephine and Napoleon had uh, financed the voyage of Baudin to Australia. And he brings back, and it's this, this voyage is actually set up in many ways, very much the way the Egyptian campaign was set up. When Napoleon went to Egypt, he didn't just take soldiers. He took boats full of learned people, people who were botanists, people who were beginnings of archaeology, people who were historians, uh, mathematicians, and so on, and brought back and codified all of this idea of the ancient world. So when he sends out an expedition to Australia, unlike the British, he doesn't send out soldiers and all the, or convicts or anything like that. He sends out a scientific expedition. And they bring back, it's a disastrous voyage, Baudin will die on the way back. However, he manages to put in another boat um, all his specimens of uh, kangaroos, wallabies, uh, cockatoos, uh, uh, what else, um, uh, emus and uh, swans. And on the, finally, when the first publication ever about the flora and fauna um, of Australia is published. It is published in France, right? The, the, the other, nothing had been published in England at all. The English hadn't really thought that it was of sufficient interest, uh, whereas the French were much more interested in this sort of cutting edge, which was what the New World was. It's the French who actually will classify the eucalyptus and the mimosas for the first time. Anyway, the frontispiece of this um, voyage to uh, Hôtels Australes all right, um, shows Malmaison on its cover with this garden where Josephine had the kangaroos and the emus and the swans um, roaming free. She also actually brought out other um, animals as well uh, and when things went really badly between her and, and Napoleon he used to take pot shots at her, private, you know, at her um, animals. She even actually brought over an elephant one day to sort of, you know, for her grandchildren. So um, she's probably best known for her cultivation of roses. She produces 250 species of, of, of roses, particularly the tea roses, hybrid ones. They all have these extraordinary names that she invents. But perhaps she's famous, most famous for the fact that she um, gets um, a well-known artist, Rudoute, a Belgian, who had worked for Marie Antoinette, who was a court artist, and he will actually produce, um, sorry, he will produce um, books of sketch of beautiful um, drawings and paintings of all sorts of species, lilacs and so on, but there is one book in particular which is just on Australian uh, flora. Uh, Napoleon is his usual style, all men of genius, all those who have obtained a distinguished place in the Republic of Letters of Frenchmen, regardless of their country of birth. <laughs> Now, uh, this is the Baudin voyage in 1800 that I had spoken of. Um, actually, Napoleon himself was very interested in these voyages of discovery, and, and when the La Perouse voyage was going off, had tried to um, get on it. Unfortunately, uh, fortunately for history, he didn't. These are some of these things. Now, the Australian plants, um, Josephine didn't just get her plants for the garden at Malmaison from um, the Baudin voyage. She also managed to network uh, with the uh, Kew Gardens, which had most of the specimens that had been brought back by Banks. And Banks hadn't classified them and hadn't published. It's really quite interesting. Um, she managed us to uh, start a correspondence with Banks. Uh, he's, he, very interesting correspondence. And during the time that Napoleon had an embargo against all things British, all right, one of the main um, ideas of, of Napoleon was to isolate the British by cutting off their trade with all of Europe. All right? and this is one of the reasons he invades 
um, Egypt was to cut off that trade route there. But it's amazing that even though her husband on the one hand has got this embargo, she manages to get her plants through the continental embargo across from England. And it's just the same way she was dealing in uh, supplies for the great army while he's out fighting the battles. So she then uh, has 24 types of eucalyptus which are cultivated at Malmaison. And this is really quite extraordinary when you think of how difficult it is to cultivate um, these kinds of plants in, in uh, the conditions at, uh, in Paris. Now, Josephine doesn't just then cultivate them, bring them across, classify them, um, and have publications which are then given to the other crowned heads of Europe. When people come to visit her, she gives them books um, by Rudoute um, with her, these wonderful illustrations of Australian plants. She also cultivates them very carefully, and um, under Napoleon, all of France had become extremely administered by Paris. So. Um, from Paris, you had all of these different provinces uh, with mayors set up, and each of whom had a garden. Right? Gardens was considered very important, and she sends her plants out to all of these in the provinces, particularly to the uh, to the Côte d'Azur. Right? So when you actually go to Nice and you see the mimosa, which is now the symbol of Nice, this of course is the wattle which has come from Australia to Malmaison via Josephine uh, down to the coast. And she's even planted um, round Napoleon's house in Corsica, you have uh, eucalyptus. In fact, um, these trees were being grown domestically uh, in gardens in France uh, before they were really in Australia. Uh, or in England, right? Because here they were growing wild, they weren't considered worthy of being put in a garden. Well, Josephine then is living at this time in exile, if you could call it that, you know, something like 20 minutes or probably three or four hours by coach outside Paris, uh, receiving visits. And this is probably the last painting of her, which is in the drawing room at Malmaison, uh, Nicholas of Russia. Um, every time someone came, she wanted to show them her garden, all right? And she was, you know, her ladies in waiting began to fight at a bit of a ball every time going out, always thinly clad. And the story is that when she um, was actually taking him out, Alexander, out to see the latest plants who were, that were, you know, that she'd grafted and so on, that she caught pneumonia and died. Um, on investigation, um, there's a lot of work's been done on, on, on this now, and it looks as though probably she was... Um, murdered uh, one way or another. The symptoms that she has in no way uh, relate to a pneumonia. It was some kind of slow poisoning, um, simply because she was becoming a centre of, of Bonaparte interest outside Paris, right? What do you have now? She's um, Bonaparte at this time was in exile on the island of Elba. Uh, the Bourbon kings had come back and were kings. Uh, this is by now, as, as this has happened. Uh, and they didn't want any kind of gathering point uh, outside Paris. And so she dies a lingering death with sort of all sorts of spots and rashes which aren't at all consistent with pneumonia, with her tongue swelling up and so on. Uh, and so um, this, when he comes back from Alba, <laughs> yes, I prefer, you're very lucky that I actually showed you this one at all. Yes. <laughs> This is Napoleon utterly defeated, um, about to um, resign, that's not the word, abdicate at Fontainebleau. And before he is, he knows he's going to go into exile with the British, but it never occurs to him uh, in his wildest dreams that he will actually be sent to St Helena. He actually thought he would probably live in house arrest in London or um, go uh, to America. He already had it worked out. There were actually escape plans for him to go. He said, no, 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 not a problem. I'll be in London or I'll be sent to America. Um, but he goes before he actually goes to give himself over to at the assigned point. He goes out to Malmaison for the very last time. Um, to relive in many ways what were probably the happiest times of his life. And he sort of, he goes with his stepdaughter Hortense, who has remained faithful to him. His stepdaughter and his stepson are there with him and even want to go into exile with him, whereas his own brothers and sisters aren't at all interested, with the exception of Pauline. Uh, so it's really quite an interesting story there. Uh, and he says to Hortense, I, I, you know, I think I can see, almost can see your mother, you know, in her beautiful, elegant gown, walking through um, the gardens of Malmaison. So uh, he says, I was never in love, perhaps, a little bit with Josephine. And when I first knew her, I was only 27 years old. So this then is this 
rise uh, really of and fall I suppose of a fashion icon someone who um, managed to survive those very early years of turbulent French history through her ability to adapt and wear the right things and then um, become the very emblem of her country um, through her marriage to uh, Bonaparte and later who will later on become of course Napoleon. Um, here you have one of the last sketches of her with this uh, characteristic crown or tiara low on the forehead but with the kind of Creole um, lace uh, veil which gives it that sort of sense of um, almost exoticness and certainly very feminine. Um, I just want to have a look at this very very last representation of her which is in the church at Rueil, right? which is Rueil Malmaison. Malmaison is the little chateau and just outside there's a little town where Josephine and Napoleon went to church and it is here that um, Hortense and Eugène, her two children, um, will set up this particular tomb <coughs> and you will recognise the effigy of her is what they probably considered that their mother felt was the greatest moment of her life when she knelt to be crowned um, as Empress of France. Thank you very much.